good morning folks good evening folks wherever in which your part of the world you are welcome to the horasis uh, meetings regarding india and a bunch of discussions all day today hosted by and actually led by frank uh, who is who is a pioneer in this field i would say of arranging conferences and now even digital conferences as you know horasis as an organization pivoted from physical gatherings which are fantastic affairs many of us who attend them understand that but now we look to the same experience hopefully in the digital world that said the panel for today which uh, i am moderating is around the topic of navigating between fact and opinion there is so much information out there how do we filter it out how do we create our own internal filter filters what kind of diet do we choose you know it's about the diet which we bring into our minds how we nourish ourselves Uh, for a healthy diet so around around these topics i'm uh, absolutely privileged to have a wonderful set of panelists with me uh, mr danny teel and adi adi billia i would request danny to start first with his opening thoughts and comments on the topic of the day and also what i will do is that i would first request each speaker to introduce themselves very briefly i could be doing that but i think it comes better if coming from you yourself let's say half a minute what organization you represent what are your core areas of work and then please dive into the topic may in what danny please and folks and audiences who are listening please do join in please keep your questions coming i see dr mithilesh has joined or chirag mehta is uh, logging in giving us a thumbs up dr rajesh bagga more and more welcome and let us try and take advantage of this wonderful conversation on a saturday morning india time midnight east coast time uh early breakfast tea time in dubai or wherever in the world you are so that said may i invite danny for his uh, opening please sir thank you what a wonderful host huh i think i should give him hands uh, together right away and uh, all throughout this show i i want to start by introducing myself uh and a couple of connections i have with india that i never really thought that uh, i would be here and speaking with you guys and that is uh I started uh, a company called MTV in New York and then went out to uh LA and San Francisco where I actually uh, attended a university that was once called the School for East West Studies which was based on the teachings of Sri Aurobindo and is now known as the California Institute of Integral Studies and it was very interesting experience uh, which led me into uh, ashrams uh, study with, with indian people and so on it was very interesting um and uh, one comment on our duties as described uh, in navigating between fact and fiction or opinion and i think i would like to just briefly define the two terms i think it's very important because i'm going to be speaking about a philosophical approach to this which is you know uh, an aware level of awareness and that is i think first of all what is a fact it's collectively perceived to be true right and then we get into opinion which is like an imaginative creation of people i call it seeming and then frank mentioned uh, about absolute facts uh, you know there there are no absolute values i want to say that right away and that if, uh, if facts are collectively perceived to be true by whom that's very important and uh the the primary word for me here is between what is between and the the betweenness is life i think where we have things like anticipation expectation indecision and that is the space between uh fact and opinion and i think that's very important in considering where we go with this topic later when i get to speak again thank you so much danny for your opening thoughts i think you laid it and expanded our topic even further by saying that you were referring to philosophy and what is absolute as such you know i i i am on board of a foundation where we research into the origins of zero so you know i mean <laughs> we just don't know i mean nothingness is everything or everything is nothing that said we look forward to your you know analysis because you are into data big data and you know logic 
So we love to tap your thoughts. We see that Somesh Biswas has also joined. Rajiv Mathur has also joined. Folks, welcome. Please keep joining and pop in your questions. That said, may I invite Adi? Adi, well, yeah, wear several hats. I mean, education, pharma, I don't know what else also. But of course, here he is with the prism of uh, journalism or mass media. And let's say what Danny was presenting the questions. Ultimately, it comes back comes down to also the message, you know, who is carrying the message, the medium or the media. So down the line, we'll look forward to Adi's, you know, analysis on that and thoughts. But sir, your opening thoughts and a brief, you know, where you're coming from, I think it helps audiences engage more and know our panelists more as people. Please, sir. Uh, thank you so much. And it's an absolute pleasure to be here and with such a esteemed uh, panelists. Uh, of course, thank you to Frank and the wonderful community uh, that he's created around Horasis. And I wish all of us were meeting in person. Uh, but I think this also affords us a very excellent opportunity to be a lot more inclusive in terms of getting speakers from all across the world, uh, you know, especially those who can't travel given the situation that is going on right now. Uh, I think you've done a very great job at introducing. I'll, I'll stick to my remarks there. Uh, I've been asked here to represent the, the APJ Swaran Journalism Foundation. And um, what the foundation does is, uh, apart from giving grants to journalists, we, we try and work with media organizations to very selectively intervene uh, uh, in the journalism ecosystem to, to try to build capacity, uh, to try to solve some of their uh, problems. A lot of our work happens behind the scenes, and we work with most newspapers and publishers uh, in India for this. Uh, I love the topic uh, today is something which I'm deeply passionate about, both climate change and, of course, fact versus opinion. I think Danny did a fantastic job trying to at least define uh, how we look at fact and opinion. Uh, what I want to do is maybe give five points uh, in context of, of you know, uh, the, the importance of, of how we discuss climate change and why, uh, despite uh, there have been reasonably broad perception and agreement that this is an issue, we always seem to run into issues. The first thing that what, what happens is that uh, there is a need, in, uh, in my opinion, uh, to be consistently credible. And what does consistent credibility mean? It, 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 it means if someone says, look, I am concerned about climate change, and this is a primary concern that I am, are they consistent in calling out everything that contributes to climate change? And of course, I'm talking about, uh, uh, you know, the huge issue of the animal farming industry. And uh, this is something that maybe contributes, depending which research paper you read, between 20 to 30 percent of all global warming, climate change, everything around the world. But it's very hard uh, on people from all sides of the aisle, especially in India, to call it out. Uh, in India, which is a little bit different from the U.S., on, on the left wing side, we have people who do promote eating a meat based diet. But on the right wing, we have, have uh, people who do promote the dairy industry. And so when we talk about climate change, uh, one thing that uh, people start to lose credibility on is that they're very selective uh, in, in talking about what really matters to them. So it's like, OK, I'm, I'm really, really worried about climate change and I'm going to talk about, you know, air pollution and cars and, uh, you know, big industry, etc. But I'm not going to talk about the animal farming thing because, you know, I will lose voters. I will lose my audience. I will lose people. So one thing which is very important is to be consistently credible and constant in what you're talking about when you're talking about the problem of climate change. The second thing is uh, to create an actual scientific space. One of the most beautiful things uh, about science is that it says this, are, this is what we know. These are the facts today. But our job is to continuously question the science, question it because that's what scientists do. If, if we were to have just assumed whatever facts were in the 18th, 19th century, when the first scientific inquiry systems came about, we would basically end up uh, having science stuck where it was 100 years ago. Science does evolve, and that's the entire purpose of science. And so it's very important for us to give science that space that say, look, uh, science is credible, not because it's infallible. Science is credible because its job is to, uh, before anybody else does anything, is to question itself first. And I think creating that space where you're talking about scientific inquiry and scientists and people who are who are depending on science, be very clear and say the first skeptics are us. 
because that's our job as scientists. That's our job as science believers is to be the biggest skeptics in the room. You, if you don't believe in climate change, you think the numbers are off. That's fantastic because we are the first people in the room to be the skeptics. You, I am as a scientist, I'm a climate skeptic first because as a, as a scientist, my job is to be a, a skeptic. And that gives you the space to science to, to take the authority to talk about these things because because the, because then you can say, hey, trust us, we are the first person. The moment we find out this was wrong or something was off, we'll come out and tell you because that's our job as scientists. And the third thing for me is I love and a lot of friends and including me were very passionate about climate change. You know, uh, you know, maybe a couple of drinks later and I'll get this lecture about Addy, you know, the, the climate, the this, the that, etc., all of that. And my worry is both people who really believe that climate change is a huge concern and people who think that climate change is not a big concern are moving away from a scientific rational discussion to something like a mini cult, maybe a religion, where it's become more of this belief system for them. I believe that climate change is important and they stop listening to fact. They stop listening to everything else and they just focus their based on opinion. It's no longer a it's no longer a scientific discussion. It's a theological discussion at this point, because what you're talking about is that you are now questioning someone's deeply held beliefs, which, which you know, you know, some people believe in God. Some people believe in climate change. Some people don't believe in God. Some people don't believe in climate change. We have to move people away from even if those are superbly passionate about climate change. This is not a cult. This is not a religion. Let's get back to science. It matters and we can have an open, normal debate a reasonable, rational uh, debate on the science, on climate change. Let's not turn what should be a very open, easy, transparent discussion to what's happening about our planet and our, uh, and, and our impact on it away from a cult, religion type of fervor, because that just shuts people off. Then either you're a believer or you're a non-believer, and you know, then science and everything else has really no role to play. The fourth problem which for which you know is is the crux of where media and journalism has issues uh the actual science and i know danny can speak on this you know just getting the data understanding what's changing uh how do you measure impact is complex there are huge number of factors and even the most comprehensive scientific data and papers have to choose they can't create a multi-factor model that includes every single thing that moves so Inherently, you end up having to translate very complicated scientific concepts and realities into what you hope is reasonable English and reasonable way for a everyday person who might be very well ed educated to understand. That translation is hard. It's hard in every field. And, and what tends to happen is that to make things easier for people to understand, we uh, people start to stop talking about science and then start looking at opinion because it's easier. But also the problem is every time you take so-called scientific knowledge and fact and you interpret it or you distill it, that's no longer fact. You've gone away from the original source. You are now venturing your translation, your opinion of what's going on. It's no longer the actual science. And one of the big things which I'm a big favor of, and I say this not just for climate change, I say it for everything else, is a demand that we return back to original texts. Now, I'll give you a political example. People say so-and-so politician is like this. They said this. They said that. Well, have you read any of their speeches? Have you gone through anything they said? Well, no, I don't have time. You know, I, you know, so-and-so opinion writer wrote about it. Or, you know, they'll say something about, oh, there is this uh, philosophy or something. Well, great. Did you actually read the philosophy book of the person who wrote it? No, no. I, you know, I know these things. I, I read five articles and three journal pieces and such. And that's the problem. The moment you go away from the original text, the original data, the original so-called established fact, because that's what is the real stuff that has been tried and tested, and you move to a distillation, which has to happen. It has to happen. You can't just send people a data set and say, hey, this is climate change issue, figure it out. It moves further and further away from fact and goes further and further into opinion. And how far you go is where then people start to sing, it's no longer about the fact, it's about the credibility of the messenger. And that's the last bit where we get stuck, is that we tend to, because we can't understand fact, 
we we start looking at okay who's saying it because we we can't read the facts for ourselves and the and if you have an imperfect messenger or a discredited messenger the facts might still be correct the opinion might still be correct people lose trust and i think that is something that 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 we have to struggle with is that you know getting the facts right being as close to the origin as we can not depending on imperfect messengers but also to understand this is a messy space and i'll start with that <laughs> awesome <Yeah. clears throat> thank you May so I much respond? Yeah. yes sir a moment just please asking just asking if i moment. can respond uh, yeah yeah Very absolutely time, that's what we want you know um, engagement but wonderful five points are the and we'll come back to them you know you touch a lot of stuff that gives space to scientists credibility consistency both sides moving away into silos you know you are preaching to the and becoming cults or 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 origins right <laughs> yeah exactly the the challenges of media and journalism to convey you know complicated facts in simpler language because uh, they want to convey to their audiences and fact versus credibility thank you so much danny sir yes you will please respond yeah. and please add any thoughts which came to your mind or which are your prepared remarks take your time I think the audiences would love this is getting to be an amazing interdisciplinary deep even philosophical and theological it's about our minds and data sir yours okay uh, uh, thank you very much you know and it's a pleasure to be talking with a with a guy from the media uh to hear his point of view I do want to say right because we were talking about politicians in the introduction and I think politicians and special interest groups um are part of the opinion network right because you've got here we are we're facing fact and opinion or fact and fiction uh danny uh it seems your which is scientific uh, and subjectivity yeah. which is kind of like personal and is the scientific approach and my is is deal with the science of data and being able to crunch that information and come up, come up with conclusions biased conclusions on things and that's a hell of a lot better than what facebook is doing or twitter or any of those other people right and you know mr trump's comment that what global change what global warming it's weather right and in and it to some degree even as humorous as it may be uh it's too much opinion going around and it's nothing more than just collective perception that's what's happening we don't know and we had this conversation before we went on the air about whether or not covid is real or not you know what i don't know because i don't trust the media at all news is actually entertainment and i would say very poor entertainment and this is what's screwing things up you know in between between fact and opinion or fiction is life and i want to bring to mind one one other comment which i think you'll enjoy and that is um we are in the midst of as nietzsche would say revaluing all values and i don't think in this period of disruption that we have enough information to be able to make a decision that's what it is with me and in data science what we want to do is objectively review and analyze data in a way in which we can which i think is the failed responsibility of the media in general to present unbiased information i mean all i got to do is look at a news article and it's like well you know donald trump that idiot said today and it's like what can i make up my own mind you know that's opinion and facts begin with opinion and then all you have to do and this sounds a lot like you know uh, national socialism in germany in the 40s and 30s is collectively perceive what you think is true and as you know truth comes to us not from us and that's a big problem when you know, it especially when you have media controlling everything we hear you know big t- uh, big tech right california silicon valley my home and it's like i'm not proud of it and then i look at things and i i i fear because recently when i made an opinion on linkedin 
I was censored. And it's like, for what? Because they made a reference to the Red Queen and Alice in Wonderland off with their heads. And it's like, that's inappropriate. And it's like, what about freedom of speech? What about freedom of expression? Can you take it? Or is being offended a capital offense? You know, I, you know, I, I had my life in theater. And I like to think that my job as a person in theater was to offend. Because if you just sit back and tell people what they want to hear, there's, there's no critical thinking going on. People can't make decisions because they're not asked to. They're just asked to receive. And that's one of the things about things like this, right, that people look at. They don't look at each other anymore. They just get the information. Or in universities, when they don't give tests anymore. You know why? Because people answer questions by Googling it, not by, you know, thinking mm -hmm. or experience or anything like that. It's like, okay, I passed the test. I can go back to, I don't know, my porn channel or or Facebook or whatever it is you're doing. Seriously, that's what people do, right? In reality. And this is, I don't know, a step beyond reality, I think, to a certain degree. I don't know. I'll, any, uh, I'll, I'll jump in there. And by the way, we are seeing a great audience, guys. If you have any questions, would love, love to uh, grab them. Thoughts, concerns, uh, would be wonderful to bring everybody in. But, you know, for I, I think Danny made one very important point here, and, and which I'd love to illustrate right. You know, what is the foundation of your opinion? And I think this and this becomes really important. You know, earlier I talked uh, about that the moment you go away further from the original data, the original fact, the original source, as you start interpreting it, as you start moving, you are now moving away from from fact and you're venturing into opinion, regardless of your intention, regardless how 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 great you might be at synthesis as as distilling, as converting. And there are many people in the world who have, who have made a wonderful and fantastic profession in translating complicated facts and science for the masses. But again, the moment you start translating, the moment you start moving away, it starts to become more opinion and less fact. But what one thing which, which fundamentally for me scares me is that when, when I talk to people and I love to say, let, let, let's look at the source, let's deep dive, let's deep dive, let's, let's, uh, let's deep dive. And often, even in climate change, I find that it is one source, one study, or one piece of data that existed maybe 10 years ago, 20 years ago. And that same piece has just been you know, reinterpreted, reinterpreted, reinterpreted. And the next person has just based their foundations on that, on that, on that, on that. No one has really gone back to question, even if it's right, but scientifically question the original piece of data or the original context, which might have been years ago. And so you build these large scale foundations of fact and opinion on, on ground, which is fundamentally very shaky. And I think this is the other big problem that we have is that the need to understand, to unpack the stack what is the foundation of this building that we have made? Different facts, different opinions, different translations, and it could be all across the geography, multiple scientists. And, you know, even those who are, who are, who are publishing papers, who are publishing science, are human after all. We've seen uh, very well-known people years later said, hey, there was a mistake in our statistical analysis. There was a slight error in our instrumentation. Now, you would hope that peer review uh, you know, multiple experimentations, et cetera, really would, would, would solve some of this, but it doesn't happen. The other problem which I'd like to, to raise at this point is that, you know, as a society and as an academic culture, and I'm putting my education hat now, one of the greatest mistakes that we make, and this is to a little bit of Danny's point of, of this entire Googling culture plus plus, we have designed ecosystems to reward new innovation. You go to a top tier uh, faculty in any college or any university in the world. You go to a top scientist, right? And they want to be the person who invents something new, a new theory, invention, system, discovery, data. We don't reward people for verifying things. I think for me, this, uh, this has been very sad because you want to get a PhD, you have to come up with something new. You, you want to become a tenured professor, you have to come up with something new. You want to be a celebrated author or scientist or a successful inventor, you have to come up with something new. What we are not doing is we are not rewarding people that saying, hey, 
as glamorous as it as glamorous as it is to to look at something new it is equivalently glamorous at least once or twice to verify data experimentation has done you know in the medical field field we have a wonderful organization called the cochrane a review and and uh, for the first time it's like very senior people who all they do is bring large data sets together and try to review them and try to understand that you know do do we trust the medicine do we trust the science and if we start rewarding people equivalently that's saying hey as a scientist as an academician as an industry person go back to that data that we created 15 years ago 20 years ago verify it re-experiment it and if you can't reproduce the results maybe we need to re-question some of those foundations we we've, we've built this building on well thank you before uh, danny may i just take a quick half a minute uh, beautiful points danny also what you mentioned in your talk about you know a uh, revaluing of our values that's a great one i would say and the freedom of speech the job was to offend which you were mentioning i think which adi also mentioned that scientists have or i think danny you mentioned that we have to be skeptical about i mean scientists are the first ones who were skeptics you know because they should own the thinking. skepticism exactly reputation. exactly and critical thinking so a lot of stuff which is going on uh, unstacking the presumptions on which we work I mean, I'm just re- reviewing it from the perspective of our audiences, and we do have Suket Singhal, Mithilesh still continues. Thank you so much, Junaid Islam, uh, Pehe Emilson, and Sumesh Biswas. Please keep any of your co- questions and comments coming. Uh, please, sir, Danny, continue the flow yeah, I, and take it as you. I heard some things I don't like. Here's subjectivity coming into the picture now. Uh-huh. You know, it, d- several times during your speech, you talked about. uh rewards recognition notoriety things like that and it seems to me that that's a bad motivating force believe me i've been around a lot of people who've got a lot of rewards you know they got the bells they've got this they've got certificates they've got that that's not a motivating force for me i don't do it so i can get a reward i do it because i want to do it i do it because i think that there's there is a i don't know if ethereal kind of reward you know uh, that i get to answer the question i get to solve the problem which i use to solve other problems so i disagree i i don't think that you know following accepted parameters is going to get us anywhere oh great i get to stand up in every front of everybody and and get a little statue or something to take home and put on the mantelpiece you know it, it doesn't do anything for me it doesn't it doesn't make me want To, Danny to, you are a wonderful human disruption. being and saint. I wish I wish Sorry? I wish more people had that attitude. <laughs> well, that's rewarding. Thank you. <laughs> Just <laughs> make a joke. <laughs> sure. Um you, you know, um every time people answer something it creates a question. Right? You know that. You're a journalist, right? And we just have to to keep digging. We just have to keep dealing with uh indecision because that's part of life you know and when i decide something suddenly something else comes into the picture and i like nietzsche particularly for uh, one explicit reason and we uh, we were talking about happiness before we got online too nietzsche is very succinct and it's become a habit of mine yesterday we had a long conversation with a business owner and i said we're going to get your motivation down to three words right no more three words you can start with 10 but we end up with 3 she got very very nervous about the whole thing and i said well you know let me give you an example happiness people d- talk about happiness i went to paro and bhutan and everybody was talking about happiness but nobody defined it right they couldn't define it and it's so fleeting you know i don't look for it i look for satisfaction i look for resolve i look for other things but nietzsche had a very interesting definition of happiness free exercise of power and i think you know that's not something that you could actually do in gross national happiness in bhutan it would freak people out but for me it, you know it it touches something in me when when the message is short and to the point and not so opinionated you know like like uh people who are bombarding us with how we should be talking what we should be doing you should be this you should be that and i say don't shoot on me i don't need it you know i value my opinion more than i do what you continuously call facts which i would like for you to define 
what is a fact for you? Thank you. I am, I am fully... Uh, Adi, Adi, may I please, before, you know... Please, please, uh, sorry. I, I want sorry. to leave this to her. Uh, <laughs> I mean, yeah. And, you know, nothing can be more fun for the moderator to, than to see, you know, two such engaged and, you know, this thing going on. But to what you said, uh, Danny, about Adi's point, my perception that when he was mentioning about rewards, and of course, he would, you know, throw some light on it. Uh, I could give an example in the day of today. For example, you see, all these pressures on the Facebooks of the world and all, now they're pressures from the governments. And I can see lots of jobs being created as factacles, right? I mean, that could be something, you know, which is also going on. So th uh, there are rewards in that sense also, not only in terms of, a, you know, individual ego, you know, furbishing rewards, but rewards overall for society, you know, research projects in deep, you know, data analysis, etc., given to universities, which the corporates are now being nudged towards at least. So, in my mind, rewards would be that, but I leave Adi to, you know, build up no, more no, of so, that. Um, you know, thank one, you for one that. Quick point. Uh, just talking on happiness, uh, you know, I, I, I teach as well as talking. I have developed a model for something I call Happiness 2020. Tom, not the year, but 20 slash 20, like Vision 2020, Hindsight 2020, which addresses the point. The happiness, as we all agree, is where we don't know. But a happiness 2020 can be at least a base camp, a base situation of my personal life. I say, okay, fine, you know, hindsight 2020, vision 2020. I'm at least somewhere this mix. I leave it at that. Adi, is all yours, sir. So first, uh, I am very happy to always interact with someone who loves uh, Nietzsche. He was a guiding force in my life for, for many, many years. I've read or most of his books, and in fact, some of the ones which I believe are actually out, out of print. I'm also a big fan of uh, John Stuart Mills uh, and, you know, the entire project of, of how, uh, you know, uh, uh, the ladders of liberties are created and, and, and how uh, the, you know, and how, so, how society structure themselves, not so much on values and systems, but on how much they want to infringe liberties based on those values and systems. But I just like to mm -hmm. sort of uh, pick up two points here. One, you know, uh, I think, Danny, again, you're a saint uh, in terms of really thinking about how you deal with a risk and reward. Uh, but for me, what's 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 very important is that uh, I wish we could go around and, and change everybody's worldview, uh, make them intrinsically motivated as human beings, not just for, uh, you know, for a greater good, but for their own selfish reasons and motivations. But unfortunately, we exist in a world where we have a lot of imperfect people. Which is, I include myself, 99.99999% or more on that. And they are guided by ecosystem and systemic uh, ways of how they should live their life, what they are enabled, what they're rewarded for. And, you know, uh, as a philosopher, uh, you know all the various systems of rewards, how it acts on brain, how it acts on humanity, how it acts on society. Connecting us back to the entire problem of, of climate change, and I'll take Danny's inspiration here, and I want to talk a little bit about freedom and liberty. One of the reasons why climate change becomes uh, uh, such a core issue and, and such a hard fought over issue, regardless of the science, the facts, the data, the logic, and, you know, we, and, and, and I talk about moving from core sources uh, to opinion to this, but then I also talked a little bit about, you know, why some people turn it not so much into a scientific discussion, but into a religion or a cult, right? And, and this to me is scary, is, is because once you have a framework or belief system that you are right, no amount of facts, mm. no amount of systems are going to pour in, right? This is so bad. Mm. And then mm. you go from being somebody who's reasonable, rational into a missionary person. You have to go out and convert people. You have to convince them climate change is bad. Climate change is great. You know, climate change, you know, is 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 destroying the world. And once you become, uh, once you go from a reasonable person who is arguing sign on the basis of science, you start becoming a zealot. Either way, either saying that climate change is good or saying that climate change doesn't exist. That zealotry, uh, when you start to go out and move on, you start infringing on people and you start infringing on people from two, two perspectives. The first perspective, this is why a lot of people react. They said, hey, what you are doing is wrong. You are destroying the planet. And people look at you and go, what, what me? 
I'm not going out and destroying the planet. No, no, no. You're doing X, Y, Z, etc. And again, and back to my original point, that loses credibility because of a lack of consistency. Right? You have to be consistent in all your points. You can't just cherry pick what really matters to you, right? That, or you go to people saying that no, 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 climate change doesn't exist. All scientists are bad. We we don't trust anybody. And I'm going to convert you to my camp. And again, you're infringing on the right to free inquiry. So I love what Danny says on on wow. on the entire perspective of freedom, of 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 thought, of expression. Back to Nisha on that. And part of it where we get stuck in in talking about climate change is we have multiple camps, all who at the end of the day want to inflict or push or put their personal opinion, their literary, their their systems on you versus saying, look, let's all take a step back. Uh, we have a scientific inquiry process. We have imperfect translators of that scientific inquiry, and that could be media, politician, individual people on Facebook, LinkedIn, and all of this. But we should not make this into something that 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 we are fighting over because of a belief system we should not infringe on the rights of people to live the way they want uh, we should not use it as a as a cushion to put people into camps if we can bring people and take a step back and move on to that open scientific inquiry i think we would come to a much more reasonable space where you have people who are able to have honest transparent discussions both ways find ways to agree and to disagree and most importantly which is why climate change becomes such a such a big issue arrive at a reasonable way to address it you can't have extremes you can't tell people i guess what the climate is in trouble you need to stop doing any development anything uh, on earth because that's our primary focus but you can also not say that hey everybody is free to pollute and you know do whatever they want because that's madness as well and so finding an open open scientific inquiry basis and finding a reasonable balance as a society between the infringements on personal freedoms to a point that we still keep it reasonable but at the same point allow individuals at least to have that personal liberty to make decisions for themselves and not try to make it into something that is enforced upon them Danny thank has you. a agreement. Thank you, Adi. <laughs> we have about seven minutes remaining, and I'm sure, uh, Danny, I'll invite your thoughts. Definitely, please. I mean, we've got good time between us. Just a small comment. When uh, Adi, you were talking yeah. about freedom, you know, uh, I remember a philosopher, Jiddu Krishna Murthy. Uh, once I read his book, where it it shattered for me. I love freedom so much that I've become a slave of the idea of freedom itself. You know. I want freedom. I want to be free. But I mean, life and philosophy as ways of going around. But thank you. Beautiful discussion, Danny. Your thoughts, please. Um, you know, I, I did my dissertation basically on the a dissident in Russia named Nikolai Berdyaev, and Berdyaev, um, as a dissident, uh, was was against the Soviet regime. And uh, it, it led me to Nietzsche, where I learned about the concept, which I included in my dissertation, which I had several different philosophies in conversation about master-slave, right? The master-slave relationship, and about what is it that makes a slave, and that's resentment, right? He feels no. powerless in, in, to 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 be what the master is. So I thought about it, and I said, you know what? Um, I believe that chaos is the natural state of being. And that chaos, uh, which, which I believe is can be substantiated, um, I wanted to introduce a third figure between master and slave, and I called him free man. Right? He was neither a master nor a slave. He made decisions for himself, and that was it. And as as a a, a person who has some theatrical experience, um, I believe in disruption, because if you don't have uh, an element that disrupts society, then people stop thinking, right? Everything is based on convenience. And yes, I infringe on people. I'm probably infringing on several people even now. But I have to remind you, to remind you whether it's climate change or whatever, change is the only constant, however you apply it, right? And what, what uh, one other comment I wrote down about uh, Northern Ireland, right, and the IRA and all of those people and the British coming in to negotiate. Do you know what held those negotiations up for so long? 
they couldn't agree on operating on the principles of fair play. Because it was a British concept, right? And it was like the Irish were saying, we're going to accept, you, which I hear in your voice, the, that there are accepted norms, that there are uh, matters of convenience that don't infringe on other people's rights. And you know what? I don't think about that. Of course, I don't go out and attack people, right? But I voice my opinion. And after 9-11 in the United States, people kept asking me, what do we need to do? What are we going to do? And I said, talk. Talk to each other, a la Freud, who learned from Nietzsche, the talking cure. You cannot be restricted, which is the, you know, the job, I think, of, of any good journalist is to encourage, and the Bill of Rights in the United States as well, right? It's freedom of expression. Am I going to be arrested after this meeting because I expressed my mind I, or I said something? Or, you know, I offended Joe Biden or somebody else like that that I have no regard for? You know, and, and then somebody's going to come and say, Nietzsche, well, that was what was responsible for the National Socialist Movement in Germany. And it's like too little information is a dangerous thing. That's what they say, right? Too little I information mean, is a dangerous thing. So we need to discuss. Uh, uh, Adi, this may I request you? We are running almost. We have three minutes so remaining. So you can make uh, it, yeah, one and a half minutes concluding comments, wrap up, and then one, one minute with uh, Danny for wrap up, please. So uh, fully with you on this, Danny, I'm a hundred percent believer in free speech. The the context and the framework, which 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 I am trying to say is is very simple, is that look. Mm. Uh, we have a reasonable scientific method and a way of inquiry, which I think has served the world well. Obviously, uh, the scientists should be the number one skeptics in the room, and that earns them credibility. I think there absolutely has to be a large degree of personal liberty, freedom of speech, and the ability of people who disagree to have their space to voice that concern consistently and, and often dramatically. Uh, because that is their right, and as and as and all of us here are, I think, believers in in a democracy. The consequences of that should not be something the state certainly is involved in. Uh, third, I think there is a happy medium, where particularly between fact uh, and opinion, that we have to get people to 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 start unpacking that tiers of opinion, tiers of fact, and start going back and really understanding and. Uh, looking at original text, original data. And the closer we can get people to that, I, I think the easier the conversation will happen. And the fourth, and uh, my, 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 my point on, on uh, zealotry, either one way or the other, I think there is, a, uh, there is a small distinction somewhere. At some point, you, you reach a point where personal freedom of expression, personal freedom of liberty uh, goes to a point where you are no longer now just voicing your opinion or you are, uh, 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 you know, being very passionate about your beliefs, but you've taken it to a point where you are now infringing on the personal liberties of others. And that I'm saying is from all camp side. And that was the only limited base where I was saying is that that's where we need, we need to all take a step back and say, look, uh, we, we need to stop making this about a cult or a red or a, zitri or a red, red, red religion and take a step back and say, as you said, Danny, talk. Start bringing it back to open conversations between people with the foundation of highly skeptical facts. That is how we will build credibility. That is how we as I'm, a... As a I'm, I'm bring really sorry. You know, it's just, <laughs> 30 seconds. Uh, Danny, I mean, thanks to everyone. Thanks to the audiences. Thanks to our panel. Danny, you have 30 or whatever seconds remaining for your concluding thoughts, sir. I have two thoughts. There is no external authority. And freedom is fundamental, even before God, because if it weren't, God himself would not have had the freedom to create. Oh, absolutely. True. Fair enough, Danny. Agreed. <laughs> okay, I think our... Personal se- agency, yes. <laughs> yes. I think our well, session okay. has Thank you guys. ended now. Uh Thanks. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. And look forward to this conversation, you know, such beautiful thoughts and cross-pollination of thoughts uh, uh, would, would be a pleasure. Thank you once again. I think that's what Horasis brings a lot of value, brings interesting people together. And that's why we love uh, to, you know, participate in this committee. Right. So thanks yeah. once again and look forward to being yeah. more in touch uh, as and when life brings us together. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank See you, you again. Thanks, Danny. Thanks, Rinder. Thanks, Sadi. Thanks, 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 Th